Lesson 1 Education in the Garden of Eden Sabbath Afternoon September 26 The Father and the Son engaged in the mighty wondrous work they had contemplated of creating the world. The earth came forth from the hand of the Creator exceedingly beautiful. There were mountains and hills and plains, and interspersed among them were rivers and bodies of water. The earth was not one extensive plain, but the monotony of the scenery was broken by hills and mountains, not high and ragged as they are now, but regular and beautiful in shape. The bare high rocks were never seen upon them, but lay beneath the surface, answering as bones to the earth. The waters were regularly dispersed. The hills, mountains, and very beautiful plains were adorned with plants and flowers and tall, majestic trees of every description, which were many times larger and much more beautiful than trees now are. The air was pure and healthful, and the earth seemed like a noble palace. Angels beheld and rejoiced at the wonderful and beautiful works of God. The Story of Redemption, page 20. Endowed with high mental and spiritual gifts, Adam and Eve were made but little lower than the angels, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 7, that they might not only discern the wonders of the visible universe, but comprehend moral responsibilities and obligations. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden. Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Here, amidst the beautiful scenes of nature, untouched by sin, our first parents were to receive their education. In his interest for his children, our Heavenly Father personally directed their education. Often they were visited by his messengers, the holy angels, and from them received counsel and instruction. Often as they walked in the garden in the cool of the day, they heard the voice of God and face to face held communion with the Eternal. His thoughts toward them were thoughts of peace and not of evil. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. His every purpose was their highest good. Education, pages 20 and 21. Adam was surrounded with everything his heart could wish. Every want was supplied. There were no sin and no signs of decay in glorious Eden. Angels of God conversed freely and lovingly with the holy pair. The happy songsters caroled forth their free, joyous songs of praise to their Creator. The peaceful beasts in happy innocence played about Adam and Eve, obedient to their word. Adam was in the perfection of manhood, the noblest of the Creator's work. The Adventist Home, page 26. Angels warned them of Satan and cautioned them not to separate from each other in their employment, for they might be brought in contact with this fallen foe. The angels also enjoined upon them to follow closely the directions God had given them, for in perfect obedience only were they safe. Then this fallen foe could have no power over them. Early Writings, page 147 Sunday September 27 The First School After the earth with its teeming animal and vegetable life had been called into existence, man, the crowning work of the Creator, and the one for whom the beautiful earth had been fitted up, was brought upon the stage of action. To him was given dominion over all that his eye could behold. For God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness and let them have dominion over all the earth. So God created man in his own image, male and female, created he them. Here is clearly set forth the origin of the human race, and the divine record is so plainly stated that there is no occasion for erroneous conclusions. God created man in his own image. Here is no mystery. Adam was placed as God's representative over the lower orders of being. They cannot understand or acknowledge the sovereignty of God, yet they were made capable of loving and serving man. The psalmist says, 
Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. Psalm 8, verses 6 to 8. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 44 and 45. Although everything God had made was in the perfection of beauty, and there seemed nothing wanting upon the earth which God had created to make Adam and Eve happy, yet he manifested his great love to them by planting a garden especially for them. A portion of their time was to be occupied in the happy employment of dressing the garden, and a portion in receiving the visits of angels, listening to their instruction, and in happy meditation. Their labor was not wearisome, but pleasant and invigorating. This beautiful garden was to be their home. In this garden, the Lord placed trees of every variety for usefulness and beauty. There were trees laden with luxuriant fruit of rich fragrance, beautiful to the eye and pleasant to the taste, designed of God to be food for the holy pair. There were the lovely vines which grew upright, laden with their burden of fruit, unlike anything man has seen since the fall. The fruit was very large and of different colors, some nearly black, some purple, red, pink, and light green. This beautiful and luxuriant growth of fruit upon the branches of the vine was called grapes. They did not trail upon the ground, although not supported by trellises, but the weight of the fruit bowed them down. It was the happy labor of Adam and Eve to form beautiful bowers from the branches of the vine and train them, forming dwellings of nature's beautiful living trees and foliage, laden with fragrant fruit. The Story of Redemption, pages 21 and 22. Monday, September 28. Intrusion. When Satan became fully conscious that there was no possibility of his being brought again into favor with God, his malice and hatred began to be manifest. He consulted with his angels, and a plan was laid to still work against God's government. When Adam and Eve were placed in the beautiful garden, Satan was laying plans to destroy them. In no way could this happy couple be deprived of their happiness if they obeyed God. Satan could not exercise his power upon them unless they should first disobey God and forfeit his favor. Some plan must therefore be devised to lead them to disobedience that they might incur God's frown and be brought under the more direct influence of Satan and his angels. It was decided that Satan should assume another form and manifest an interest for man. He must insinuate against God's truthfulness and create doubt whether God did mean just what he said. Next, he must excite their curiosity and lead them to pry into the unsearchable plans of God, the very sin of which Satan had been guilty, and reason as to the cause of his restrictions in regard to the tree of knowledge. Early Writings, pages 146 and 147. The knowledge which God did not want our first parents to have was a knowledge of guilt. And when they accepted the assertions of Satan, which were false, disobedience and transgression were introduced into our world. This disobedience to God's express command, this belief of Satan's lie, opened the floodgates of woe upon the world. Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, April 5, 1898 Satan had rebelled in heaven and had gained sympathizers who loved him and followed him in his rebellion. He had fallen and caused others to fall with him. And he had now tempted the woman to distrust God, to inquire into his wisdom, and to seek to penetrate his all-wise plans. Satan knew that the woman would not fall alone. Adam, through his love for Eve, disobeyed the command of God and fell with her. Early Writings, page 148 Eve thought herself capable of deciding between right and wrong. The flattering hope of entering a higher state of knowledge led her to think that the serpent was her especial friend, possessing a great interest in her welfare. Had she sought her husband, and they related to their maker the words of the serpent, they would have been delivered at once from his artful temptation. 
our first parents chose to believe the words as they thought of a serpent. Yet he had given them no tokens of his love. He had done nothing for their happiness and benefit. While God had given them everything that was good for food and pleasant to the sight, everywhere the eye might rest was abundance and beauty. Yet Eve was deceived by the serpent to think that there was something withheld which would make them wise, even as God. Instead of believing and confiding in God, she basely mistrusted his goodness and cherished the words of Satan. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, Pages 42 and 43 Tuesday, September 29 Missing the Message Satan commenced his work with Eve to cause her to disobey. She first erred in wandering from her husband, next in lingering around the forbidden tree, and next in listening to the voice of the tempter and even daring to doubt what God had said. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. She thought that perhaps the Lord did not mean just what he said, and venturing, she put forth her hand, took of the fruit, and ate. It was pleasing to the eye and pleasant to the taste. Then she was jealous that God had withheld from them what was really for their good, and she offered the fruit to her husband, thereby tempting him. She related to Adam all that the serpent had said and expressed her astonishment that he had the power of speech. Early Writings, pages 147 and 148 Our first parents, though created innocent and holy, were not placed beyond the possibility of wrongdoing. God made them free moral agents, capable of appreciating the wisdom and benevolence of his character and the justice of his requirements, and with full liberty to yield or to withhold obedience. They were to enjoy communion with God and with holy angels. But before they could be rendered eternally secure, their loyalty must be tested. At the very beginning of man's existence, a check was placed upon the desire for self-indulgence, the fatal passion that lay at the foundation of Satan's fall. The tree of knowledge, which stood near the tree of life, in the midst of the garden, was to be a test of the obedience, faith, and love of our parents. While permitted to eat freely of every other tree, they were forbidden to taste of this on pain of death. They were also to be exposed to the temptations of Satan, but if they endured the trial, they would finally be placed beyond his power to enjoy perpetual favor with God. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 48 and 49. Our only safety is in giving no place to the devil, for his suggestions and purposes are ever to injure us and hinder us from relying upon God. He transforms himself into an angel of purity that he may, through his specious temptations, introduce his devices in such a manner that we may not discern his wiles. The more we yield, the more powerful will be his deceptions over us. It is unsafe to enter into controversy or to parley with him. For every advantage that we give the enemy, he will claim more. Our only safety is in rejecting firmly the first approach to presumption. God has, through the merits of Christ, given us sufficient grace to withstand Satan and be more than conquerors. Resistance is success. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resistance must be firm and steadfast. We lose all we gain if we resist today, only to yield tomorrow. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, pages 482 and 483. Wednesday, September 30. Regaining what was lost. Adam and Eve both ate of the fruit and obtained a knowledge which, had they obeyed God, they would never have had, and experience in disobedience and disloyalty to God, the knowledge that they were naked. The garment of innocence, a covering from God which surrounded them, departed, and they supplied the place of this heavenly garment by sewing together fig leaves for aprons. Had Adam and Eve never disobeyed their Creator, had they remained in the path of perfect rectitude, they could have known and understood God. But when they listened to the voice of the tempter and sinned against God, the light of the garments of heavenly innocence departed from them, and in parting with the garments of innocence, they drew about them the dark robes of ignorance of God. 
If Adam and Eve had never touched the forbidden tree, the Lord would have imparted to them knowledge, knowledge upon which rested no curse of sin, knowledge that would have brought them everlasting joy. Conflict and Courage, page 17. God has called His people to glory and virtue, and these will be manifest in the lives of all who are truly connected with Him. Having become partakers of the heavenly gift, they are to go on unto perfection, being kept by the power of God through faith. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. It is the glory of God to give His virtue to His children. He desires to see men and women reaching the highest standard, and when by faith they lay hold of the power of Christ, when they plead His unfailing promises and claim them as their own, when with an importunity that will not be denied they seek for the power of the Holy Spirit, they will be made complete in Him. The Acts of the Apostles, page 530. When the earth was created, it was holy and beautiful. God pronounced it very good. Every flower, every shrub, every tree answered the purpose of its Creator. Everything upon which the eye rested was lovely and filled the mind with thoughts of the love of God. Through tempting man to sin, Satan hoped to counteract the tide of divine love flowing to the human race. But instead of this, his work resulted in calling forth new and deeper manifestations of God's mercy and goodness. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 87. Let none think that there is no more knowledge for them to gain. The depth of human intellect may be measured, the works of human authors may be mastered, but the highest, deepest, broadest flight of the imagination cannot find out God. There is infinity beyond all that we can comprehend. We have seen only the glimmering of divine glory and of the infinitude of knowledge and wisdom. We have, as it were, been working on the surface of the mind, when rich golden ore is beneath the surface to reward the one who will dig for it. The shaft must be sunk deeper and yet deeper in the mine, and the result will be glorious treasure. Through a correct faith, divine knowledge will become human knowledge. Christ's Object Lessons, page 113. Thursday, October 1. The Despisers of Authority. Adam and Eve suffered the terrible consequences of disobeying the express command of God. They might have reasoned, this is a very small sin and will never be taken into account. But God treated the matter as a fearful evil, and the woe of their transgression will be felt through all time. In the times in which we live, sins of far greater magnitude are often committed by those who profess to be God's children. In the transaction of business, falsehoods are uttered and acted by God's professed people that bring His frown upon them and a reproach upon His cause. The least departure from truthfulness and rectitude is a transgression of the law of God. Continual indulgence in sin accustoms the person to a habit of wrongdoing, but does not lessen the aggravated character of the sin. God has established immutable principles which He cannot change without a revision of His whole nature. If the Word of God were faithfully studied by all who profess to believe the truth, they would not be dwarfs in spiritual things. Those who disregard the requirements of God in this life would not respect His authority were they in heaven. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 311. It was pride and ambition that prompted Lucifer to complain of the government of God and to seek the overthrow of the order which had been established in heaven. Since his fall, it has been his object to infuse the same spirit of envy and discontent, the same ambition for position and honor, into the minds of men. He thus worked upon the minds of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram to arouse the desire for self-exaltation and excite envy distrust, and rebellion. Satan caused them to reject God as their leader by rejecting the men of God's appointment. Yet while in their murmuring against Moses and Aaron they blasphemed God, they were so deluded as to think themselves righteous and to regard those who had faithfully reproved their sins as actuated by Satan. 
It is by sinful indulgence that men give Satan access to their minds, and they go from one stage of wickedness to another. The rejection of light darkens the mind and hardens the heart so that it is easier for them to take the next step in sin and to reject still clearer light until at last their habits of wrongdoing become fixed. Sin ceases to appear sinful to them. Conflict and Courage, page 108. Love, the basis of creation and of redemption, is the basis of true education. This is made plain in the law that God has given as the guide of life. To love Him, the infinite, the omniscient one, with the whole strength and mind and heart, means the highest development of every power. It means that in the whole being, the body, the mind, as well as the soul, the image of God is to be restored. Lucifer in heaven desired to be first in power and authority. He wanted to be God, to have the rulership of heaven, and to this end he won many of the angels to his side. When with his rebel host he was cast out from the courts of God, the work of rebellion and self-seeking was continued on earth. Through the temptation to self-indulgence and ambition, Satan accomplished the fall of our first parents. And from that time to the present, the gratification of human ambition and the indulgence of selfish hopes and desires have proved the ruin of mankind. Reflecting Christ, page 51. For further reading, The Acts of the Apostles, Steadfast Unto the End, pages 529 to 536. And, Selected Messages, A Mystery, Book 1, page 249.